I fear not the dark itself, but what may lurk within it. Welcome to Lurk, bringing you creepy, strange, and bone-chilling stories with your host, Jamie Jackson. Welcome to this week's episode. For this episode, we're going to be looking at some stories about past lives or reincarnation, which is something that has fascinated me personally for years. I actually had a past life regression done, and I'm going to tell you all about it, but that's a little bit later. Don't worry, this isn't a technologically heavy or technologically isn't the right word. I'm not going into a lot of nitty-gritty book learning for you. This is mostly stories about children and other people who have had memories of another life. It's entertaining, not educational. So let's get definitions out of the way just so we know we're, we're all on the same page. Reincarnation is simply the rebirth of a soul into a new body. For instance, you die, but your soul does not, and eventually gets recycled into a brand new body. The rebirth, reincarnation concept is seen in major Indian religions like Hinduism and Buddhism. With reincarnation, the soul continually cycles through new bodies or lives, learning needed life lessons And this continues until the soul learns whatever it is it needs to learn. Could be a lesson about love, could be a lesson about communicating, could be a lesson about money. Not every soul needs to learn the same lesson, and most have more than one lesson to learn. And I'm not talking about long division or fractions. I'm talking about deep deep life lessons. In these lives you've lived, referred to as past lives, you've interacted with some people in more than one of those lives. That friend who you have that intense connection with may have been a friend or loved one in another life. Sometimes that person is put in your path over and over again because there's something to learn from the relationship or a need to heal the relationship in some way. If you want to know what your past lives were, you have a past life regression done. According to Wikipedia, past life regression, past life therapy, regression, or memory regression is a method that uses hypnosis to recover what practitioners believe are memories of past lives or incarnations. The practice is widely considered discredited and unscientific by medical practitioners and experts generally regard claims of recovered memories of past lives as fantasies or delusions or a type of confabulation. Past life regression is typically undertaken either in pursuit of a spiritual experience or in a psychotherapeutic setting. Most advocates loosely adhere to beliefs about reincarnation, though religious traditions that incorporate reincarnation generally do not include the idea of repressed memories of past lives. Personally, I feel that if your soul has lived more than one life, somewhere there should be some kind of memory of it. With that being said, I am also skeptical of past life memories because it seems everyone wants to be a Native American princess, Cleopatra, or some equally famous ancient person. Ten people can't all claim Cleopatra as a past life. So that's a basic overview of reincarnation. And now I want to get into some of the stories of people, mostly children, who seem to have memories of former lives they have lived. I think children remember these lives more readily because they just left that previous life, so their memory would be more vivid. Our first story is the story of James Leininger from Louisiana, USA. 
James was born in 1998, and starting at the age of two, James began to have frequent nightmares about being a World War II fighter pilot who had been shot down by the Japanese. He would often wake up screaming, airplane crash on fire, and little man can't get out. His parents, Andrea and Bruce Leininger, initially thought nothing of the dreams, assuming that they were just a normal part of childhood imagination. As James got older, he began to provide more specific details about the pilot's life, including his name, Jane Houston Jr., the name of his aircraft carrier, the, the Natoma Bay, and the names of some of his fellow crew members. James also drew pictures of his plane and described how it had been hit by enemy fire. The Liningers began to research the details that James provided and were shocked to discover that they were all accurate. James Houston Jr. was a pilot who had flown off Natoma Bay and had been shot down by the Japanese in 1945. The Liningers were also able to contact surviving members of Houston's squadron, who confirmed that James's descriptions of the plane and the events leading up to the crash were accurate. Researchers who have studied James's case believe that it provides strong evidence for the existence of past lives and the phenomenon of reincarnation. Others have suggested that James's memories may have been triggered by exposure to World War II history, or that they were simply a result of a child's overactive imagination. But the specific and accurate details that James provided suggest that there may be more to the story. Next up is the story of Shanti Devi. Shanti Devi was a young girl born in Delhi, India in 1926. When she was just four years old, she began to tell her parents that her real home was in another town called Mathura, where she had lived as a woman named Lugdi Devi, who had died 11 years earlier. Shanti Devi provided many specific details about Lugdi's life, including her husband's name, the names of her in-laws, the layout of her house, and the names of several family members. Shanti's parents initially dismissed her claims as childish fantasies, but as she continued to provide accurate and detailed information about Lugdi's life, they began to take her more seriously. They eventually decided to contact Lugdi's family in Mathura to see if there was any truth to Shanti's claims. When they arrived in Mathura, Shanti was able to correctly identify Lugdi's former home and family members, even though she had never been there before. She was also able to provide accurate and detailed information about Lugdi's life and death, including the fact that she had died during childbirth. Lugdi's family was skeptical at first, but after Shanti was able to provide them with information that only Lugdi would have known, they began to believe that she was indeed the reincarnation of their loved one. The case became widely known in India and attracted the attention of many researchers and journalists. Shanti Devi's case is considered one of the most compelling examples of reincarnation. It has been studied and analyzed by many researchers including the famous psychiatrist Dr. Ian Stevenson, who visited India to investigate the case and later published a book about his findings. Some skeptics have suggested that Shanti may have been coached or fed information about Lugdi's life, but her ability to provide accurate and specific details at such a young age remains a mystery. Another child, a boy named Ryan Hammonds, began to have vivid memories of a past life as a Hollywood actor named Marty Martin. He was able to provide specific details about Martin's life and career that were later verified by researchers. Then there was the story of the Pollock twins. In the late 1950s, two young girls in England named Joanna and Jacqueline Pollock were killed in a car accident. A few years later, their mother gave birth to twins, who she claimed were reincarnations of her daughters. The Pollock twins, Jennifer and Jillian, were born in England in 1958, just over a year after their parents had lost their two-year-old daughters, Joanna and Jacqueline, in a tragic car accident. 
The family lived in the town of Hexham in Northumberland, England. When Jennifer and Jillian were around three years old, they began to exhibit behaviors and make statements that suggested they had memories of their deceased sisters. They would ask for toys that had belonged to Joanna and Jacqueline, and they would refer to past events that had occurred before they were born, such as trips the family had taken or games they had played. The twins also showed a strong preference for certain foods and toys that had belonged to their sisters, and they were able to identify family members and places that they had never been to before. In one instance, when they visited the cemetery where Joanna and Jacqueline were buried, Jennifer immediately went to the grave markers and said, that's where we used to play. The family was initially skeptical of the girls' claims, but as they continued to provide accurate information about their sisters' lives and personalities, they began to take them more seriously. The case eventually attracted the attention of researchers and was studied by a number of experts, including Dr. Ian Stevenson. The Pollock twins' case remains one of the most famous and well-documented cases of reincarnation. While skeptics have suggested that the girls may have been influenced by their parents' grief, or that they were simply making up stories, the accuracy of their statements and behaviors suggests that there may be more to the story. In the 1970s, a young boy in India named Gopal Gupta claimed to remember a past life as a man named Puran Singh, who had been killed in a train accident. He was able to provide many details about Singh's life and family that were later verified as true. Born in Lebanon in 1954, Suleiman Andre recalled a previous life. As a child, Andre claimed to even know some of his children's names from his previous life. It should be noted that Andre was born to a Druze family. Druze is an Islam-derived religion that believes in reincarnation. Andre also remembered coming from the village of Garif, where he had an olive oil press. Around five or six, Andre's family heard him muttering the names of individuals in his sleep. He later claimed these names were some of his children. At 11, Andre refused to lend a book because he remembered a policy in his previous life of not doing so. He later remembered the name Abdallah from his previous life. Over time, Andre chose to not talk about his memories because it led to teasing. In 1967, Andre visited Garif. Residents of Garif confirmed that a man named Abdullah Abu Hamdan owned an oil press and had lived there. Andre also recognized various landmarks while there. Professor Okado Masayuki is a Japanese linguistics professor who publishes and researches childhood reincarnation cases. One of the most compelling Masayuki cases involves an interview conducted in 2015. The previous life was that of a woman with three children, including a beloved daughter. Tragically, the woman passed away in 1993. The next year, the daughter got married, relocated, and had Tay at 19, in 1996. Tay reminded Atsuko of her mother. When Atsuko handed a picture of Midori to two-year-old Tay, claiming, This is your grandmother, the child responded, Me. Similar to the Andre case, Atsuko's family practiced Zen, a religion that believes in reincarnation. When Tay was three, Atsuko suffered a spell of depression over her mother. One day, when walking with Tay, Atsuko heard Tay say, I have to cheer her up. Atsuko reported feeling like her mother had returned. Later, when Masayuki re-interviewed Tei when she was in her late teens, she could not remember Midori or her previous life. The reincarnation story of Dorothy Edie was a is a fascinating story that began when she died at the age of three. She fell down a staircase and was pronounced dead by the family doctor. Imagine the doctor's shock when she received a call to come back to the house not an hour after he'd left the grieving parents, who were now telling him that their little girl was actually alive. 
This was the beginning of Dorothy's lifetime belief that she was a reincarnated Egyptian priestess who lived 3,300 years ago. The revived Dorothy no longer spoke with a British accent, but rather an Egyptian one. She began having vivid dreams of a temple with a lush garden. She constantly begged her parents to take her home. Instead, they took her to the British Museum. While looking at photographs at the British Museum with her family, Edie saw a photograph of Seti I, an Egyptian pharaoh. Edie claimed the place depicted in the picture was her home. When she saw the Egyptian statues, she ran over to them, kissed their feet, and hugged them, declaring to her parents that these were her people. At the age of 15, Edie had a dream where she met the mummy of Pharaoh Seti I. Edie claimed that Pharaoh made her remember her previous life. Edie's odd behavior, including sleepwalking, resulted in her being placed in a sanitarium for several, several times. Her obsession with Egypt led her to move there with her Egyptian husband and to name her son Seti. She soon recovered her memory of being Bentrishit, or Harp of Joy. She was a priestess and the mistress of the pharaoh Seti I. She broke her vow of celibacy when she became his lover, but to make matters worse, when she became pregnant, she committed suicide to spare the pharaoh public humiliation. Eventually, Dorothy's past life obsession destroyed her marriage that ended in divorce. She remained in Abydos, working with the Egyptian Department of Antiquities. Her knowledge of ancient Egypt astounded archaeologists. Few people had the privilege of seeing inside the Temple of Seti I, but the department wanted to test Dorothy's claims. Archaeologists led her into the dark temple and asked her to describe it. She passed with flying colors, describing everything inside the temple, even though she couldn't see anything. Outside, she pointed out where the garden had been, and upon excavation, tree stumps were unearthed. Dorothy enjoyed a full life working with archaeologists at the ancient temple of Seti I. She was given the nickname Alm Seti, or Mother of Seti, in honor of her son. Her contribution to understanding ancient Egypt was highly valued. How do you explain a situation like that where someone has such in-depth knowledge to the point of helping archaeologists? Next we head to Scotland, where a young boy remembers another life. Macaulay was born in Glasgow, Scotland in 2000. At the age of two, Macaulay started talking about a previous life on the remote island of Barra. The little-known island of Barra is located in Scotland's Outer Hebrides. The child soon started demanding that he go to Barra with his other family, about whom he could provide multiple details, including the family surname. Macaulay also claimed that his previous father had been struck and killed by a car. At the age of five, Macaulay went to Barra where the child located the Robertson home. While inside the residence, the child grew very sad. The boy told his mother that he missed his previous mother. Can you imagine being a mom and being told by your kid that he missed his other mother? If mine said that, I'd probably tell them I'd send them to their other mother. In 2017, two-year-old Luke Ruhlman began to worry about his safety at his family's Cincinnati home. The child also named a ladybug Pam, even though his family knew no other Pams. Shortly after, the child started naming everything, ranging from toys to drawings, as Pam. Luke also began to claim that he had previously been a girl with black hair and used to have earrings. When the family asked who Pam was, the boy replied that it was his name from a previous life. The boy claimed that Pam died, went to heaven, saw God, and that God eventually sent the spirit back to earth as Luke. Strangely, the child's family was not religious and had never discussed religious subjects in front of him. The boy later revealed that he had been killed in a fire while jumping from a Chicago building. The child did not even know where Chicago was located. The boy's mother later researched the Paxton Hotel, a building that mostly housed African Americans in Chicago. In 1993, a fire occurred at the property and trapped many of its upper floor residents. Could Luke have lived as Pam previously and died in the Paxton Hotel fire? 
In case you were wondering, like I was, if there was information on victims of the Paxton Hotel fire, let me read this article from the Chicago Tribune. Services have been scheduled for several of the seven people identified as victims of Tuesday's fire at the Paxton Hotel. Twelve of the 19 known victims remain unidentified, Friday. Eight other people are missing. The Cook County Medical Examiner's Office has identified the seven as Vita Wilson, 32, Idana Morrow, 49, Florencio Coronado, 91, Percy Alsup Jr., 42, Charles Harms, 56, Theodore Warren Guernsey, 60, and Pamela Robinson, age 30. A memorial for all the victims will be held at 3 p.m. Sunday at the LaSalle Street Church, 1136 North LaSalle Drive. So yes, there was a Pam who died in the fire. One reincarnation story left an impression on Dr. Frederick Lenz, who wrote in his book, Lifetimes, True Accounts of Reincarnation, about the verified claim by a boy named Charlie who at age four recalled his death at Pearl Harbor. Mary, Charlie's mom, was shocked when her four-year-old son said, I died once, and it hurts. It all began when Mary took her daughter and son to a cliff diving performance, and on the way back to their car, Charlie blurted out, I died once. Mary thought he had dived and asked him when he had dived, and young Charlie quickly corrected her, No, I died once, and it hurts. Mary asked how he died and replied that his leg was badly hurt. Over time, Charlie's story was pieced together through these conversations. In his past life, he was born an only child named James Kello from San Francisco. When he was in his 20s, Kello was a naval officer and served on board a warship. The ship was bombed and exploded. James and three other men made it into a lifeboat, and when they got to shore, James dragged the only surviving crew member onto the beach. James fell onto the beach and died. Mary decided to take Charlie to visit the decommissioned USS Alabama, having misheard the name of the ship. She didn't find James Kello on the ship's roster, and the guide told her that the Alabama was never hit, but the USS Arizona was. While there, Charlie scooted about the ship as though he were a seasoned sailor. Later, his mother began researching the USS Arizona, lost during the attack on Pearl Harbor. Eventually, she was able to check the Arizona roster and found an officer, James Kello, from San Francisco. Dr. Lenz verified these and other aspects of Charlie's story, including the recovery of Offer Kello's body and those of the men in the lifeboat after the Arizona was struck with a Japanese torpedo bomb. The bomb hit the ship's magazine and exploded on December 7, 1941, during the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The ship is still lying at the bottom of Pearl Harbor, and the USS Arizona Memorial, just out onto the water, just above the ship's hull. The next story is one that got me interested in reincarnation, as I had stumbled on a movie made about it. Jenny is a British woman who knew from a very young age that she had lived another life. She knew her previous name was Mary, a young woman who had lived in Ireland in the 30s, and worst of all, that her early death had left her six children helpless. A A desperation that she could still feel, like a strange shadow, This was a weight that pushed her to unravel all those apparent memories and sensations. At eight years old, Jenny Cockle knew she had not always lived in England. Her dreams were always focused on the wet Ireland during a time of hard work and survival. She also knew that her name had not always been Jenny. The other woman who lived in her dreams, her name was Mary, but she never could remember her last name. Jenny always tried to have a somewhat normal life. Only a few knew that in reality, her life was halved because every day, new pieces of the daily life of a woman named Mary came to her thoughts. She knew that Mary, the Irish, walked a lot. Her house was near a stream and her hands and fingernails were always dirty from the ground potatoes she harvested and collected. 
She knew that she sometimes would go hungry and never ate meat, only flour, bread, and vegetables. And she was in an area near a railroad. Jenny also knew that Mary had died during childbirth at age 35 and that her death was with great despair and rage. It was too soon. Her children were still too young to be left without a mother. What would become of her six children? Such was the intensity of those feelings and emotions that Jenny Cockle underwent regressive hypnosis. Afterwards, the memories and suffering became more vivid. More details started to appear. This woman's story of reincarnation got to the BBC, who was very interested in this sort of case. They published it in various media formats, and, to everyone's surprise, the repercussions reached Malahide, a small village in Ireland, where a farmer had identified Mary and her six children. Her name was Sutton, and she had died in the Rotunda Hospital in Dublin on October 24, 1932, because of gangrene, pneumonia, and toxemia. And she didn't leave six, but seven children behind. Jeffrey, born in 1923, Sonny, born in 1924, Philomena in 1925, Christopher 1926, Francis 1928, Bridget 1929, and Elizabeth 1932. The farmer tracked down her third son, Jeffrey, in Ireland, who gave him the addresses of two of his brothers, Sonny and Francis. Jenny contacted all of them, developing a very special bond with Sonny. For the details provided, memories and words, each of these people recognized their real mother in Jenny. The suffering has now been lessened. The mother's pain about leaving her young children was softened, knowing that they had survived, were older, elderly, and had led a full life remembering her mo their mother, who gave everything for them. It's hard to believe an amazing reincarnation story that serves to make us think about the afterlife. There is a book titled Across Time and Death, A Mother's Search for Her Past Life Children by Jenny Cockle. And there's a movie starring Jane Seymour. If you're interested in reincarnation, I recommend reading the book, which I will put a link in the show notes. And I'll put a link to the movie in there as well if I can find it. I mentioned at the beginning of the episode that I had my own experiences with reincarnation and past lives, and I will share them with you now. It started innocently enough. In college, I was preparing for a poetry reading for the college literary magazine. I was a mom at the time, and my daughter was about the age of three. She, like she had to do many times, was stuck hanging out at the college library while the magazine staff and I worked to get everything set up. Earlier, when we arrived at the college, the Christian club was in the lobby handing out those small green New Testaments. So my daughter had one and was sitting under a table reading. One of the magazine staff walked over to her and asked, Is that a good book? or something similar to that, and my daughter responded with, Oh, I read this already, back when I was a boy in Germany. She also went on to say, I was a boy, and Aaron was a girl. Aaron is my brother, and though he and my daughter are ten years apart, I'd have to say the two of them had a pretty strong bond from the time that she was born. About four years later, I had my own past life regression done. It wasn't anything that I sought out, and I wasn't having any kind of weird feelings or dreams about a past life. I mean, you have those feelings about a place, mostly that you're comfortable in it, and personally, I think that sometimes speaks to a past life. This had more to do with a former mother-in-law who was trying to find information about whether or not I was soulmates with her son. Anyway... I agreed to this regression. I was on my couch, lying there, with the person conducting the regression sitting in a chair next to me. Basically, she took me through breathing, and I ended up in what felt like a deep meditative state. She had told me she didn't do hypnosis, but whatever. I've, I've never knowingly been hypnotized, so I don't know if I was hypnotized or if I had just 
put myself into a self-hypnosis or, like I said, a deep meditative sleep. I was aware of everything. One of the things that I remembered is a small clapboard building and a white picket fence. I was wearing a light blue 1800s era dress with no hoop. The person doing the regression asked me if I knew what year it was, if I had a coin or something. And I remembered the year 1872 and that I was a teacher. The next thing I remembered was a trail ride on horseback with a male companion. We were riding through the woods, I think racing through the woods, maybe not a gallop, but probably at a canter. I was laughing. Then something happened and the person I was with was thrown and hit a tree and died. I remember feeling heartbroken. And at this time I was brought out of the meditation because my pulse increased while I was telling my memory and my breathing became very fast, like I was panicking while I remembered. She had asked my husband, her son, at the time if I was afraid of horses, and he said, no way. I mean, I started riding at the age of 10. I've, I've had a love affair with horses my, since I was a kid. I started actually riding at the age of 10. At this point, I was in my mid to late 20s, and I loved horses. I had a horse of my own, participated in many shows, especially loved jumping, definitely not afraid. Or so most people thought. The woman doing the regression was a little confused because my reaction to the memory made her think I might have a fear of horses and riding because of what I had described. But what my former husband didn't know is that while I was more or less fearless in the confines of a riding ring, I was terrified to go trail riding. I would literally look for places to fall off safely. If I took a fall in the riding ring, I'd hop back on. In fact, one time I rode with a significantly swollen knee that had me on crutches for two weeks. No problem. On the trail, any little fall and I was ready to just walk home leading the horse. Not an exaggeration. Anyway, I can say that this particular memory has, has stuck with me and I think about it from time to time. And the man named Matthew who died on the trail. And after that regression, I actually began to be less fearful of trail riding. Another point I want to make, the person doing the regression never suggested anything to me. I was fully cognizant of what happened and what was said, and I was not led at any time. Other than the fact she was curious if anyone was familiar to me because she wanted to see if someone in a past life was my husband in my current life. Not currently current, because <laughs> this particular husband I don't have anymore. What's your thought about reincarnation? Believer? Strong non-believer? Just don't know? It's a lot of unknowns with it. That's going to do it for this episode of Lurk. Remember, you can find Lurk wherever you listen to your favorite podcast or at lurkpodcast.com. On the website, you'll find all of our episodes along with links to our social media accounts. Be sure to like, follow, or subscribe. And until next time, keep lurking. Mm-hmm.